Guys, it was a couple years ago at Indianapolis where I had a younger member of the media come to me who knew that I knew Greg and say, hey, I've seen he won like five races or something. What's the deal? People talk about Greg with such great reverie, but why? The numbers genuinely don't match. And had to explain to him that, no, if you're judging Greg based on a Wikipedia page, you wouldn't understand why we hold him in such high regard. So I figure now, with the 20th anniversary of his loss, it's a perfect opportunity to bring some of that context. Where should we start, thinking back 20 years without Greg Moore? What comes to mind? Ziz, shoot. All right, I'll open. Um, I think when, when you see Greg and what we all saw in him was a tremendous talent. There's certain guys during different eras and generations that they got it. And he was a guy I think we'd all agree he had incredible talent. We knew that it was just a matter of time he'd be a great champion, multiple champion, Indy 500 champion. He was the guy, and we all saw it. Off the track, equally as cool. That's what we really loved about him. He brought the paddock together, these guys together, going to Surfer's Paradise, and we'll get in that in a while. But he was just all around just, just an awesome guy and an awesome talent, and I think we all appreciated it and enjoyed it. What about you, Dario? Again, this, we hate anniversaries like this, but maybe it gives us a chance to share some love. Yeah, absolutely. It's a, it's a, it's a shit time of the year, actually, with this with, with Greg's anniversary. It's, uh, people are like, oh, Halloween. I'm like, oh, God. Um, but to go back, I think the best way for new race fans, I think you've got to say, is go on YouTube, watch his races. Don't watch his crash. Watch his races. Watch some of the things he did. Um, I guess the... The person that maybe he relates most to was another Canadian, Gilles Villeneuve. Yes. Look, look at the stats. Gilles didn't win a championship, won a few races, but people still talk about him in this, these revered tones. Greg was the same. Watch what he did with a, a racing car. We, we all drove those crazy kart cars. You know, yeah. they, they bit, they bit hard, and he, yeah, he drove them with such abandon and such flair that, uh, yeah, I think that's what one of the reasons he was so loved by by the fans, by, by his fellow competitors. Um, and that, yeah, when you, know, when, when you lose a driver, when, when a driver dies, most, a lot of people will say, oh yeah, only good things. People were saying good things about Greg long before that. He was, you know, he was already fan favorite. Um, he was already all our friends. He was so, so well thought of and, uh, you know, 20 years hasn't dulled any of that. Max, what about you? You, on top of holding a, a great passion for Greg every day. You were so proud of helping to organize the, the latest Greg Moore celebration at the, after the end of the, the Portland race here. He seems like someone, even like a Jeff Krosnoff, who just lives inside of you. Every time I think about Greg, uh, uh, I think about how much of a catalyst the guy was. It was mm. amazing. Good like word. A, Oh. He just looked that up. Do you remember? I, I, I learned that on my dictionary. Do you remember how I was doing? <laughs> yes. yes. I, I learned that yesterday. I highlighted on the dictionary. Well done. And I didn't learn about it. That's what I was doing every day when I came to the U.S. But, you know, the thing about Greg, you know, for me, as I told you, like, you know, it was, uh, it, it really, the, one of the reasons why I really loved him is the fact that he taught me something that I didn't know. You know, I, I remind you this, you know, I came from Europe, I was racing in F1, grew up over there, came over here, and uh, on my first trip to Australia, I have this guy sitting on my side who actually talked to me. And, uh, and then I, I went like, that's not possible. Like, you know, where I, where I came from, people didn't, the race car driver didn't talk to each other, you know, unless there was something bad. Or it's your number one enemy. And, uh, and it really changed my approach to the sport. You know, to, it made me look the fact that I, you know, you could have be super tough on the track, but that didn't mean that you couldn't share common, you know, feeling or uh, drink a beer after the race or doing or something. Or two like or 10. Or 50, <laughs> <laughs> 200. And, uh, you know, to, to me, it really changed the way I, I looked at stuff. And uh, he was, uh, as I said, you know, he was the biggest reason. You know, for it, and uh, and uh, I will. I cannot thanks him enough. And as Dario said, you know, 
the number don't stack up. You know, when you look at the number, it's actually funny what you just said. You know, I didn't even know that he only won five races. To me, in my book, he won 50. And uh, the way he drove, you know, like, that's, it's actually, I'm really surprised about what you just told me. Uh, that five, I went like, really? Five? And, uh, but I guess that you cannot measure someone just from the number yeah. standpoint. You know, the guy was immense uh, on and off the track. And uh, uh, I really believe that he's one of those guys that he happens once in a, in a generation. You know, like, I don't think you can really replicate anymore what happened in the, in the past. But to repeat what you were saying, you know, I, what I really love about the party that we throw at Portland was that I enjoyed the fact that the younger generation, the Rosenquist, uh, the Veach, uh, they were able to Jack kind Harvey, of Ferrucci. Jack Harvey, exactly. Yep. You know, all these young guys, they, I, I, I kind of felt that in one way that night we did what Greg did with me that day when we flew back, when we flew down to Australia to say, hey guys, yeah, maybe you guys can knock each other off on the track, but you see? We can be brothers hand, off. You know, be, you know, and, uh, and I felt, I hope that that uh, stuck in their brain, because it did in mine. <laughs> Paul, you were already a big established star yeah. when Greg came in. Obviously the leading light for Canadian IndyCar fans. We get this somewhat quiet, not sure, kind of, stick, you know, upright. Yeah, look at that. Yeah. Well, yeah. I, I, I knew of Greg long, long before his IndyCar career because the parallels of my career and and in his career early the early stages of it were very similar because you know I mean the glasses you know I wore glasses like that and he wore the same glasses so, there's a telescope and then not working you know right. when I was when I was 16 I was you know won the Canadian Formula Ford championship and I started hearing about him just when he was finished carts and uh, this was in about 90 1991 I think he started racing Formula Fords in Ontario and you know that there was there's some newspaper articles said oh there's a kid racing out at Mosport and he's like he looks he's wears glasses like Paul Tracy and he's he's tearing up the track out there so I, I kind of got to hear a, a lot of a lot of buzz about him Formula Fords and then uh, Formula 2000 he won the championship and then did you know kind of the same trajectory is me formula ford formula 2000 then a little bit of atlantic and then indy lights and you know the the similarities are you know formula ford champion indy lights championship broke broke my record i held the record for the most wins in indy lights then he came along and, the team and broke, I broke that, was um, broke that yeah, yeah broke that record and so i knew of knew him before he got to Indy cars and he would come to me as a kid and ask for advice when he was in Indy lights and I was racing Indy cars at that time and he would just ask how the track is and and uh, he really kind of the players deal was that was really a pro French Canadian program they didn't have any yeah. in, in English speaking Canadians in that program it was very pro Quebec uh, deal so when he got into that that program that was a pretty big deal and uh, I was actually looking to get into that deal if it was if it was possible before I was with Penske, uh, with Marlboro, and and ultimately ended up up there at, for my championship year. So there's a lot of sim similarities between his career and my career, you know, parallels. And Paul, I have a question for you. Uh, you basically were the dog, the Canadian guy. You were winning races, and uh, you were established and. Uh, Canada is not a big country, yeah. so when you had a guy like him, you know, with no disrespect, let's say, like Patrick Carpentier came as well, but Greg was on a completely different level. Yeah, you know, was it, you know, how the Canadian looked at it, you know, like or how you looked at it? Was it like a threat? Was it like what you you were welcoming him? You know, you were like you had to of, share the limelight all of yeah, a sudden. Yeah, how was it? How did you feel? Uh, in, well, inside? I mean, we've had we had a lot of good fast Canadians, so obviously, you know. Jacques. Scott was fast, yes. and Jacques was very fast. He's, you know, he's he's the best Canadian. He's a world champion and IndyCar champion. So, um, you know, I was always always welcoming. You know, sure, I would compete with you hard, 
and not make it easy at all. I mean, you know, when I was teammates, when we were teammates, you were new to this and I was, you know, I, there wasn't anything I held back from you secret Never. wise. Took you, you know, I said, hey, let's go get on my private plane and let's, let's go, right? Yeah, and, like, uh, big time. And we ran each other hard. No contact ever. Full and, respect uh, on track. Yep. But like, it wait, was, no, an, it's, no. it's always, uh, the way that I learned IndyCar racing from Emerson and Rick, it's, when I got into IndyCar, those guys helped me. They said, whatever my setup is here, you can have my setup. And that's the way I was taught from Emerson and Rick. Uh, not so much by Al and Michael mm. when I was teammates <laughs> with them, but Emerson and Rick were a very open book to me, nothing to hide. And I, you know, I kind of treat everybody the same way. If somebody asks me a question, I tell them what it is. You so know? was no was no problem to be the king Canadian and have a, a young guy kind of like feeling that was kind of taking the chairs out of your you know under from underneath you. No, no, I didn't have have any issue with that. There's you know you 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 guys know that you've been been around in the paddock long enough that you know there's guys that you can go ask a question to and they're going to completely bullshit you. Like uh, yeah. Robbie Gordon is is one like you ask him a question, he'll tell you the exact opposite of what's what's going yeah. on. And then there's guys that you can rely on for information. Well, I did when I was at Hogan, I used to come and ask you questions and you're like, "Hey, yeah, yeah. There you go." Yeah. Interesting. So when I saw Greg's dad, Rick Moore, at Portland and told him that we would be recording this, he had one, one thing to say. I don't want to hear. <laughs> That's what he used to tell us. <laughs> we can't tell all the stories, right? No. There's an understanding that understood. Oh, yeah. Nonetheless, there are, when I think of Greg Moore, I think of stories. And oh. I know... There are some that will be saved for some that are saved and told in non-public settings. This Absolutely. is something a folks lot. will be listening. And the, the three of you are grinning like mad right now. I asked some of you to help me with some, you know, some of your favorite stories. Let's see how many we can get through here. Uh, the Australia to Milan trip. Should we start with that one? I no, there were two one. different trips. <laughs> yeah. Well, there was a, there was that whole summer though. Yes, and the summer started. I mean, I didn't go home from June until December. We just traveled the, 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 the world like, we were like gypsies. We were just, um, whether it was... The, the Times were different then. We tested so much. Yeah. We were gone nonstop. I mean, you were basically race to test, to maybe a short vacation for a day or two, then test and race. Yeah, but we had no attachments. We didn't have girlfriends. We didn't have wives. We didn't have, you know, we barely had houses at that yeah, point. I, I was renting a house, so. Yeah. And so we, we went round... And we, we, we just this, did this tour around the races and just, you know, when we weren't racing and beating the crap out of each other on the track, we were, you know, partying or trying to play golf or riding yeah. bikes or all these. But, but still being, a, you know, pro in a way that I think that this, I think it's important to send a message to the kid, to the young mm -hmm. generation, because uh, it's not that it was all, uh, you know, bottle to throttle in 12, 12, 12 hours. No. You know, it was, uh, there was a time that, uh, you were just a regular human being, and then a time that you were a badass race car driver. And uh, th then you could Very leave. clear boundaries. Yeah, very, very clear boundaries. But those times where you were yourself, uh, uh, there were the times when uh, we took the bus uh, <laughs> from, uh, from mid-Ohio, mid -Ohio, and uh, I was not allowed to drive the bus because Rick told Greg that if you have Max or Dario driving the bus, I... I Consequence, it would be hard. I was allowed to drive the bus. I, was, wow. I wasn't. So the only one who was not allowed was me. I ended up having to drive really? it through Chicago. I'd never driven a bus before, and I'm driving this thing through Chicago, Russia, or traffic. A big Prevo bus. But that was the trip where, so we'd stopped off in Cleveland after the middle highway, stopped off in Cleveland. In the flats. In the flats for a night out. Um, on the next part of the journey, we're driving along, and all three of us were trying to do our deals for next year. And it was, so you're driving along, uh, phone would ring. Can somebody take over driving? I have to take this. So take over. You'd run in the back of the bus. You'd be in there talking to <laughs> like either my agent or a team owner. Then Max's phone would ring. And Max was like, i got to take this. And he'd run back into the bedroom. And a lot I of times remember. we were all talking to the same team owner. And then Greg's like, oh, i got to take this. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I don't think any of us actually moved teams. But we, there were some shenanigans going on on that trip. 
But we never talked about it. We never said, oh, I'm talking to Bobby no. Rahal or I'm talking to Roger Penske or I'm talking. None of that. It was just wall that off. Kept that was business. That was business. Yeah. And, so. uh, and the, the business stopped at that door. You know, remember the back door uh, in Greg's bus when yeah. we went there on the back. And, and actually, I didn't think about it the way you say it, you know, but I, I actually, now that you, that you tell me, I, I recall that very, really clear like that there was a, this uh, unwritten boundary you know, where we didn't even have to tell each other, hey, they let, it was like, okay, this is, this is us, uh, a race car driver, this is us, the human being. And uh, yeah. almost like a compartment on and off, right? Yeah, I went to a test in Phoenix and at Firebird, and the, the, our guy, we were testing Wednesday, say, and I went there on the Tuesday to look at the track and um, Greg and, and Chalice, were, they were testing and I kind of walked up towards the tent and I see Greg and Steve look and Chalice walked up and basically said, gotta go, sling your hook. <laughs> and I thought at first I thought, ooh, and then I thought, no, no, absolutely, no, that's fair. fair I shouldn't, enough, I yeah. shouldn't have been there. Um, yeah, very, very clear boundaries. But I agree with uh, Rick. There are certain stories uh, that, that uh, they're better not told. The statute because, of uh, limitations. Gre yeah, Greg's, bu time. Greg's bus though was like the, the hangout spot of all the buses that because there was a group of guys that had buses it was me there were not many like you tony had one robbie had one i don't think you, you did Herta, had one Herta had one but tony I, had like, the charlie sheen bus literally didn't oh no hundreds of hours were spent after everything was done in greg's bus playing that fucking PlayStation <laughs> yes. with the fucking rally game <laughs> yeah. or, or or Gran Turismo and I was pretty decent at it when it was like before PlayStation 2 came out, when you had to play with your thumbs and do the steering with your thumbs. But as soon as that joystick controller came out with the finger throttle, I was junk. And Done. you guys would lay down these times on, on, like, on that goddamn rally game that we, where you go through the dirt and through the trees. Yes. I, I, would get, I would play that damn thing for literally five hours a night, six hours a night. We'd be there till 11 o'clock at yep. night, every night of the weekend. I remember. We're none of us looking at data. Chalice was there. <laughs> Robbie was there. Beat each Everybody, other. Up. Yeah, try, and trying to shave hundredths of a second. Yeah, I remember the the the, the kitchen, the kitchen. So when Max first came to to America, he was very much Euro trash. You know, you, you do not drink a, don't, you don't, a cappuccino. Would, you don't drink it after <laughs> breakfast. And you know, I have very clear rules. Very clear rules. And then all of a sudden, he's eating an Olive Garden. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> But before that, Greg was like, hey, Max, you got to eat something. You want some food? You want some pasta? He's like, this is not pasta. This is macaroni and cheese. <laughs> yeah. So maybe we need to tell the story that, you know, the, on the mac and cheese. So Greg hasn't, ha Greg has not won a race yet. You know, I, not much experience on an oval. I go and ask these guys about how to drive on an oval. Wasn't Where asking it, me. I knew less no, than no, him. No, <laughs> like, uh, yeah, that, that, like, we, that's for another story. Yes. Uh, we are in Milwaukee. I show up there in, in this famous bus and I go there asking Rick and, and Greg, hey, I, I think I, I don't feel the limit. I think I need to crash. And, and Greg, and Greg <laughs> said, mm, you don't want to do that. And he said, yeah, but I can't feel. And, and Rick said, mm, just, when he feels not good, come in. And I went like, ah, old guy. <laughs> so that's when Greg at night uh, offered me at about 9.30, 10, hey, I'm having dinner. And I see him, you know, for me in Italy, dinner is like dinner. You sit down at the table, you, have a, you open up this and he brings out this little blue box, mac and cheese by Gnar. And I, and I go, is this dinner, bro? Uh, yeah, that's dinner. So I told him, if you win the race tomorrow, I will eat this shit for the next month and a half. What happened the day after on Sunday, obviously I destroyed my car, crashed. He found it. the limit. Yeah, I found the limit. <laughs> Coming out of turn four, spang! Uh, Greg ends up winning the race. I'm st still beat up, fires it on. Greg and Rick in winner circle. I walk this way and not a single word was exchanged. I looked up and I go, mac and cheese. And he go, you're screwed. <laughs> 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 that was the, com the conversation. You know, and then that's it. I left and that for a, about a month and a half. He came on Friday and Saturday and made me this mac and cheese stuff. You know, dude, 
like you're still for an Italian guy. And now you give it to your kids, probably. Yes. <laughs> and every time I give them a reminder, they say, this is the picture of this guy. That's why they had to learn about the mac and cheese stuff. Oh, my goodness. And uh, yes. So mac one of the things that I love about Greg, <laughs> in again, this, there are stories we can't tell. You look at photos of Greg, and it's just this angelic boy, little blonde-headed boy, must go to church every minute, <laughs> every minute of his life. You look at him, you could get that impression. If you didn't know Wrong him. If impression. you didn't know him, but then there's things like his fashion sense, oh God. Oh which my. might contribute to the f belief that he was a bit of a nerd. Again, at, at night, he maybe disproved that a bit, but just share, yeah, you're, 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 you're clearly having you a know, moment, Max. You know. I still have in my wardrobe that, you know, Greg was hooked up with those people at Hugo Boss. Uh, with uh, this lady, Don, this Don, Don. <laughs> Hugo Boss, and I hooked up. I, I think they were exchanging what, what something were those, more than. What were those goofy shoes that we used to give? Fluvo. Fluvo. <laughs> Fluvo. <laughs> those flipping shoes. They look like flippers. <laughs> <laughs> That's the one I had 16. at the party. Yeah, yeah, the one we were drinking over the party. Yeah. yeah. And uh, so he, he had this. He came over and said, Dude, I, I have this suit. It's amazing. Hugo Boss. Hugo Boss Safari. And. But he looked like plastic. And when he passed, I went inside his wardrobe and I told Rick, I want to say, I need that. And I got this Jean Fluvoc shoes that I kept them with me. I used them at the party. And, uh, and actually more than that, he actually convinced me that this Fluvoc things was a great thing. So every time I went to Toronto to race or Vancouver, I always stopped at the Jean Fluvoc and I have these uh, shoes. Uh, I bought in, a pair too. <laughs> yes. That, uh, I mean, Maybe you wear size 10, but they look like size 25. Yeah. <laughs> the great then, water skis. Yeah. yeah. So it was, that's what I said, you know, there were some fashion violation situation. And, uh, or as you would always say, fashion disaster. Fashion disaster. Fashion. And he was actually proud of it. Well, the fashion disaster was when you tried to wear his suit because your legs oh, are yes. about <laughs> this much longer. So I these, remember he was that skinny. Uh, I mean, yeah. And he, literally, there's this much between the shoes and, and, and the bottom of the, no, the it trousers. It was already a very short <coughs> suit for him. I remember, because I you remember when, when he wore it in Italy, that he couldn't really move. He was like this. <laughs> I think he I thought think, he looked cool. Yeah, I, th I think he, <laughs> like I think like a he used the, he bought like a size, like three sizes too small, but you know. He yeah, showed off. It's still in my wardrobe and uh, sometimes my kids look at it and say, Papi, what's that? It's a long story. Oh, you got it. We got, we need photos of that. It's a long story. <sighs> So let's bounce around a little bit, little bit, guys, as we start to close here a little bit. Let's talk about some Greg Moore on track experiences. There are some great wins in there. Uh, Michigan 98, I think Dario is one that stood out in terms of dueling and whatnot. Let's, let's shed some love on a guy who, again, maybe angelic if you thought in person, but the wheel, Animal. that guy was ready to just knock down Animal. the world. So yeah, 98, we'd had the, the Hanford by then. And so that changed the style of racing on the super speedways. And the target team, Vassar, Zanardi, were obviously, and the Honda engine was strong. Mercedes maybe not so quite, quite so strong at that point, but um, we found out in later years um, when, when Zanardi and, and, and Jimmy got together, they told us the whole story, but um, Greg, they were working as teammates at, at Michigan and they, they were sort of helping tow each other and they were, before the race, they were so confident they were going to win that they were, they figured out a way to divvy up the prize money that, oh. they, that they could yeah. get more of the money wow. and more of the win bonus um, and basically get Chip's portion of it too. So they'd done this whole intricate deal that they thought um, they had won because who could beat the two of them? Well, they didn't sort of really factor the kid from Maple Ridge and he out the pair of them on the last lap and the toe was massive. It was like a 15, 20 mile an hour toe you could get on those cars. He out them both, pulled away, wins the race. He was, he was so happy to have done that and it really burst the bubble of, of both Donardi and Jimmy. Jimmy got his own back though in uh, Fontana because to win Fontana in 98 was a million dollars. Jimmy won the race 
Greg finished second, they got 60 grand. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, there must have been some Scotsman because he was all about the money. Yeah, I'm sure it was a lot of Scotsmen. A lot of Scotsmen. And, and Jimmy was really nice. He didn't rub it in his face. Didn't right? rub it in his face at all. We went to Vegas for a week afterwards um, for a little R&R &R after, after the season, yeah. And we had this bus, the Johnny Fever bus. <laughs> and um, the, the million dollar novelty check was displayed. Yeah, so let me explain a little bit. The Johnny and Fever bus was a bus that outside looked like a Hertz bus, but inside has a, had a, a brass pole. I mean, limousine. It was a, a limousine. A limousine. Oh. And, uh, you know, strobo, strobo lights and... Uh, Big sound system. And uh, it, was, uh, it was definitely not used just to he carry people. He was the first people. guy to have party bus. He came party up bus. with this idea and now every, there's party buses yeah. everywhere. Right, yeah. but this was that was 20, this was twenty years yeah, ago. Yeah, ninety eight. Uh, it was definitely it, used to not just carry people. No, that is right. Absolutely That's not. That's a delightfully <laughs> undersold line. <laughs> and every time Greg walked into that bus after we were in some various club, he would see that million dollar check, Jimmy Vassar. Yeah, <laughs> and he just goes, <laughs> "Son of a." <laughs> <laughs> yep. Just a reminder. Yep. Yeah, but I said, you know, like, uh, uh, as Greg, uh, you know. His success were uh, amazing, you know, like I remember him uh, uh, being, uh, you know, so amazingly fast on an oval, like uh, uh, him coming up to us and showed that it was like, it was 98% flat uh, in Homestead during qualifying. Wow. And remember that? Yeah. That was like... Uh, I was breaking. Sense. Yeah. No, like insane. And, uh, and at the same time... Uh, uh, him making the most stupid mistake in Vancouver, hitting the wall uh, on this uh, practice uh, because, uh, at least you know, based on what his dad said, you know, he thought he didn't prepare himself. He was not focused enough on that. And uh, but again, you know, you know, what I really, th when I re when I look at Greg, uh, and I think the young generation need to really remember is the fact that uh, talent is what counts. Mm. Speed is what counts. Speed comes from God. He had a lot of speed. It was very natural. Uh, yeah, he had to clean himself up in, in some of the straight road courses and stuff like that. But uh, at the end of the day, you know, I think that nowadays uh, people believe that uh, you got to build yourself, right? And uh, uh, he, was, he was the 0.1%, wasn't he? He was that exceptional talent. He was that... Remember he qualified on pole though in Houston yep. on the road course. I mean, he, he could... And he won in Detroit. He... The problem, his last season, 99, the Mercedes was not competitive. Yeah, not competitive. And on road and street courses. And, and that was, it, it, was a, it was a shackle to him, wasn't it? You yeah. Know? Well, not only that, is the bravery was way up there too. Oh, my word. <laughs> you yeah. know, like there was nobody that, like, I remember the first, I remember the first time he beat me straight up, we were in Motegi. And it was late in the race, like literally last lap, last corner, he got me. And we went down the back straight away, and I covered him, and I'm like, okay, I got him beat now. And we go into turn three, four, and it's, you know, then it was speedway wings, and you were fucking flying down the straightaway. Like 227, oh, break, down, downshift a couple yep. gears, and then back to the throttle hard. And I, like, can hear somebody, and then I see, I see this blue <laughs> car on my outside, and I'm like, what the fuck? <laughs> and I'm like... <laughs> And he's, he came around the outside of me and beat me to the line. And I was kind of pissed about it. And we go through turn one and two, and I pull up beside him on the back straightaway. And I look over, and he's just like, he's just waving at me like this. Like, he was, <laughs> like you could see the smile on his helmet, how happy he was. I was kind of, yeah. you know, yeah. hacked off right, about yeah. it. But yeah. you couldn't. Yeah, you know, I was like, holy shit, how'd he pull that off? He you loved know? doing that. He loved just hanging the thing out on the edge more than anybody I've ever seen. And it was just, from the first time I watched him, I was doing DTM, sitting watching him with Norbert Haug in Germany, watching you guys go around. I'm like, who is this kid? He loved to hang the thing right out on the edge. Um, and that's how, I, I guess, I always remember him doing yeah. that. And, and I, I remember the Dario. obvious, but we have Paul Tracy, Max Pappas, and Dario Franchitti saying, this guy is brave. brave. When most people look here for the standard for bravery, I mean, that, yeah. that I, says something. Well, he was a guy that he loved the outside. Yep. He'd be on the outside of the oval in the worst, put yourself in the worst possible position. You know, that's like the place, like, you put yourself in a, in a bad position when you're on the outside. And he, he loved being out there. 
And that's, I mean, at the end of the day, that was ultimately what was the downfall because he was way on the outside trying to pass a bunch of cars and yep. and lost it. And you know yeah. the lap before, he was having a ball. He was yeah, passing yeah. cars left and right, just having a ball. You yeah. just know he was. That was that was what he, he, yeah. he loved. I, I don't know if I ever told you that, Dario, but like uh, that day in Fontana, we were walking, you know, Greg, uh, the player's trailer was here, the Ray Hall trailer was here. No, he got he hurt his, his hand. He shouldn't and, have actually been driving. Yeah. <clears throat> like nowadays people would tell you not to drive, but back then when you hurt when you were goofing off and you hurt yourself, you're like sucked it up and got in yeah, the car. Yeah. But nowadays drivers don't do that and I mean you know. Yeah, like yeah, and I remember we're walking to the grid. I am What start- was the what was the real story on, on the on the scooter thing? How did he fall off that thing? I think a lady reversed out or something, and he was going along. And yeah, it was with a fan. Not paying attention, looking at a girl. He's probably looking at a girl, yeah, exactly. <laughs> looking at it. it was Karen McDougal. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So what he did, we're walking up there. I'm starting uh, the first two, three row, and Greg is last. I was at the back, too, with him. Oh, really? Yeah. So, I mean, I remember, like, like if it's today, he, he looks at me and says, you see the pylon? Give me 10 laps. You're gonna see my name. I said, ah, 20, no, 10. It's, it's, it's not car number 99. Last, I was, I think after two laps, I was in the lead. And I look and I say, shit. Here he comes. 20 second, 20, 12. <laughs> and, and I went like, look, it's gonna be here. Like, you know, give me another five laps, it's gonna be here. and. Uh, but again, you know, I, this is how I personally see how it's gonna, how it went down. And I have, I told this to Rick as well. I have this picture. Maybe I'm, I'm maybe it's me that I look at it in this way. But I see him losing it in Fontana, sideways. He's floored. Smoke coming out and going say, Yeah, guys, look at that! Bam! <laughs> Something happened. He wakes up and he goes like, Where am I? What happened? And uh, so I'm gonna have to answer, ask that uh, when I go and meet him up there. <laughs> Cause, uh, but I, I think is, you know, if he would have made that, uh, he would have, he would have still been here, telling us how awesome was that saying. Yeah. Unfortunately, it didn't happen. And, uh, but I, I can tell you, I doubt that would have, that was any, anything than a smile on his face or anything. That, then, wow, look at me, how badass I am. Yeah. He didn't like confidence, did he? And that was... And that accident in today's world <coughs> would have been no big deal. Yeah. To, with now with the pavement and everything, the way tracks are designed now, I mean, that was a really bad design with the grass and then the pavement. He hit that pavement and then the thing started to roll. And that was, you know, these are the things we learn now, you know? Yeah. Yeah, but the, 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 again, you know, when I look at that, uh, sometimes uh, I see, you know the tone of our, even our conversation going down. But I honestly, I, I can't do that. I, I, yeah. I, I, only, I always remember and think about uh, his smile, him showing up in Portland with his H1 uh, 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 and driving it for like 70 seven, miles that, an hour the whole way. The Viper. The back window fell out. What? The back window fell out of his Viper. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, it was always a story. Like there was always something. It was never like a dull moment. You should go up and sh- you go and visit him at Maple Ridge. And where do you go? It takes you to the, the pool. mechanical bull. You know, yeah. and, and so it's like, it's not, oh, let's go and have a drink. No, let's go to the mechanical ball. Life was for living. <laughs> Every minute of life was for living. He's one of those guys you would get the phone call in the morning or if you were staying at the house. <laughs> right. We're going to do stuff. What are we doing? I don't know. Stuff. <laughs> you know, we're going riding bikes. We're going to play golf. We're doing this. We're doing and that just all the time. And yeah. at, at first... After his accident, it was very sad you know, for a long time. Yes. But then it became we could look back and, and look back with happy memories, and we could talk about it and stuff. And that uh, that took a long time, but it's to look back now in twenty years, you know, it's, it's, it's crazy. I think it was really cool from my perspective because I came in about the same time you guys all did. Was to see how genuine the relationships were with that group. And you're, everyone was similar, like you said, everyone was single. We're going to Australia, we're going to Brazil, we're having fun. 
Some well, I, w- I was, and I went through a couple wives. And then <laughs> <laughs> I, got, I got grounded. Just, just, I got grounded just from a lot of fun. Not part of that picture. I didn't. I didn't get a. I didn't get a hall pass. <laughs> you got half of it. And and to see it was incredible. What I really liked. I do all the press conferences. These guys would be on the podium together, and they just busted their ass for a couple hours, fought, you know, tooth and nail against each other. And the first guy to congratulate him would be Greg Tadara, Dara to Greg, Max, PT. And it was really cool to see that how much they respected and appreciated each other's talent. And I thought it was very special during that era.